Equity mates and the people appearing in this program may have positions in the companies mentioned. This is general advice only. Please speak to a financial professional to understand how it may pertain to your individual situation. Equity I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Equity. Hi, Equity Mates, and welcome to the first in our interview series where we interview the best and brightest investors out there, both professional and amateur, and bring them right to you. We talk about everything from the highs of success and the lows of failure different strategies for choosing stocks through to words of advice and hot tips to help you on your journey. Alec and I are very excited to bring you our first investor for the series, the brilliant and entertaining Andrew Brown, who is the Executive Director at East 72 Holdings Limited. Andrew has over 35 years of experience in investing that has taken him all over the world. As we debriefed at the end of episode four, this is a fantastic interview for us to start with because it's full of words of wisdom, advice, tips and tricks that we think will appeal to all levels of investors. Personally, we've learned a lot from this interview already, so we hope you enjoy. As always, we'd love to hear your feedback, and if you have any questions for us, or even Andrew, then please hit us up on our Facebook or our website. So what got you interested in investing? Um, pretty simple. I did, um, in years 11 and 12 at school, I did economics, and um, in those days, and we're talking the mid 1970s here, so just please bear that in mind. And please bear in mind the economic situation in the mid 1970s was best described as horrific. It doesn't matter where you are, Australia, the UK, obviously, grew up in England uh, or America. So um, I did economics in the equivalent of years 11 and 12, and in year 12, we had a um, stock picking competition as part of the economics. Uh, piece which looks about what the stock markets do, you know, and their obvious means of raising capital for companies and allocating capital, and as luck would have it, I happened to win the stock picking competition um, with a company called Thompson Organisation, which at that time owned a whole bunch of UK newspapers, uh, which it sold to an enterprising young lad from Adelaide called <laughs> Rupert Murdoch. Um, so I won that, and it just got me really, really interested. I did... Uh, economics and econometrics at university. Uh, econometrics is that statistical bit of economics, um, you know, which for people who can't do maths, um, it's the sort of next best thing. Um, and then I basically, um, when I did the rounds of uh, getting a job after university, um, had a few offers, and one of them was to join the Prudential, which at the time was the UK's biggest investor in the stock market, the property market, and every market. It's a big life insurance company. And I was lucky enough to get a job with them on their overseas uh, investment side, which is overseas shares. So, um, And to be blunt, uh, I've been doing it for 35 years and I've never done anything else. <laughs> so, um, yeah, actually 37 years this year. So I've never done anything else. You know, I've never sold cars or, or whatever. Just, you know, I've always had my head in the stock market. Um, yeah. So I suppose. I suppose. Why? Yeah. I mean, it is. It, it's. It's a unique um, occupation, and it's a unique interest uh, on on a number of grounds. I mean, the first unique thing about it is uh, every employer tells you to hire somebody that's smarter than you, and of course nobody does because they're frightened the smart boy or girl will take your job. Um, in investing, I mean, it's unique because that, that's what you're looking to do all the time is to give money or invest in people that are much smarter than you are. And of course you get hundreds of opportunities to do that, whether it's a company that's run by brilliant management or giving your money to an investor who is a fantastic investor. Um, secondly, um, you get to learn about a multitude of industries. Um, you know, everything you know, in Australia, everything from mineral exploration, you know, mineral production through to insurance, life insurance, um, you know, we've got a few pharmaceutical companies, whatever. So, and what you'll find is obviously you have a natural tendency to gravitate towards certain types of companies because you understand them a bit better or you just have a passion for them. Uh, I have a, I'm lucky, I have a passion for financial companies. So banks, insurers, you know, and insurance scares the hell out of most people, you know, because the profits are illusions, you know, they're, they're made up by actuaries. Um, uh, fund management companies, 
uh, and things like that. And uh, as we might discuss, they all get very exciting when stock markets going up and down. Um, so it's this really unique thing that that you know, if you're interested in investing, you can never ever get bored. You will meet all kinds of people. You will meet some of the smartest people you've ever met in your life, and you will meet rampant crooks. <laughs> and helping to distinguish between the two is a really good idea. Yeah. So it's great, and of course, it takes you. You know, potentially, if you do it professionally, it takes you around the world. Yeah. Um, you know, I've worked in London, I've worked in New York, and obviously, you know, I now choose to work in Australia. Yeah. Um, increasingly now, of course, with you know, with, with the ubiquitous internet, um, unlike the old days where if I wanted an annual report from a US bank, I wrote to them by mail <laughs> and they sent me one back by mail. So if we were lucky, it took two weeks. Uh, now everything's on the internet. Um, you can sit and listen to the webcasts of quarterly or half or full year earnings, um, you know, with all these amazing people, um, you know, talking. You, can't ask questions yeah. as a small investor, but you can certainly listen, you can see all the presentation slides, and so you can get to understand uh, these industries, these businesses, and these companies, um, you know, literally sat in your bedroom, if you say, mm. so wish. Mm. So it's fascinating. It's just, I can't envis. I don't know that there's another job that's this interesting. Yeah, mm. yeah. So taking you back to your early days of investing, yeah. um, what what was sort of daunting for you at the start, or what what did you struggle with at the start of your investing journey? I think there's um, three things that like that I really you know probably struggled with. The first is the most obvious one, which is losing money. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> you have when you're starting out, and unless mum or dad or you have a very rich uncle who <laughs> decides to give you a ton of money. I mean, basically, you don't have a lot of capital to invest, and so you are paranoid about losing it. Okay, and and yet, of course, it's a great paradox that the best way to learn is to lose money. Okay, and so, but you don't have much to lose. So, what that does is the second uh, difficulty. It makes you really impatient. Okay, so you find you know you make a ten percent profit, let's say, on on your investment, and you take it. And then you find you actually leave another ninety percent on the table, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know because you've just been so jumpy that you've made a profit. Um, so that's the second thing that's really hard. It's the impatience, uh, and you've got to find a way to get over that. And I'll try and explain you know, as we go on some ways to do that. Um, and the third thing is probably it's just the realization of how little you really know. Okay. You know yeah. because you're starting out, yeah. and um, you know as, as as we'll go on. I mean it's just it sort of becomes a bit frightening unless you can commit time to it. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, it is, it is so, so, so important that if you are going to be an investor uh, and you're going to look after your own money, whether you're doing it privately or whether you're doing it professionally, um, you have to dedicate time to this game. And so then you've got to work out how you dedicate your time. If you can only do it at the weekend and a little bit at night, then you've got to slim down what you're looking at. If you have a lot more time to dedicate to it, then obviously you can look at uh, a whole lot more things. Mm. So that's the, that's the, that was the third thing, really. It's, it's that whole issue of realising, my God, I just don't know anything. <laughs> I think there are three things that resonate with me pretty yeah, well as well. Like, yeah. Still, like, still do. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. The fear of losing is just like, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely right. So... Um, where where has your investing journey sort of taken you? Everywhere. Um, yeah, it's basically taken me across the world. I've, I've been lucky enough to you know um, um, invest in, in global equities um, as well as Australian shares, and so I mean on company visits um, as as an analyst, obviously I've been to different countries looking at different operations. But um, I was a stock broker, uh, stock broker for quite a number of years, so. Um, I used to be uh, one of the best known banking analysts in Australia and also insurance analyst um, and so I mean that's taken me across the world to speak to clients about Australian banks and uh, Australian insurers you know so all the obvious places the UK you know right across the US you know it's Tuesday so we must be in Boston uh, type of idea and obviously to Asia and uh, right across Europe so you know it's taken me everywhere basically. Wow. Have you noticed any major differences between Australia and some of those other... Yeah, things? absolutely. Australia is ridiculously insular. 
Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazily insular, which is really sad because um, one of the big things about Australia is Australia is the world's fifth largest pension market. Mm. Oh, wow. uh, thanks to the you know, innovations of Paul Keating um, and what you guys now know as the superannuation yeah. guarantee charge, mm. um, you know, we, we have this absolutely massive pension market, which um, for a lot of years, I mean, I can tell you, you know, 40% of your money, if you put it into a, just a normal balance fund, would go into Australian equities. Um, and yet the Australian share market is a really, um, it's actually quite boring because... <laughs> A third of the market, or a third of the index that you see on the television each night, the Standard and Poor's 200. Yeah. That's well, bank stocks. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then there's another 17% or so of the index of resource companies, and there's four of those absolutely dominate you know, mm. BHP, Rio, Woodside, and Fortescue. Um, and, uh, and then, sort of in the top 10, and the top 10 are about 60 odd percent of the market, you know. That's made up of you know errant retailers like Woolworths, um, you know this conglomerate which is very well managed but has an inherently slow growth, which is West Farmers, um, and you know and and the nightmare of everyone's life Telstra. So why is it you think that they don't look more broad, um, more broadly overseas? Well, increasingly they are, thankfully. Um, there's there's a lot bigger allocation now to overseas shares. Uh, a lot of that's done through Australian domiciled fund managers such as Magellan and Platinum. Um, and um, the, the, the increasing fact is, I mean, if you look at the Australian stock market, it has no IT sector of any consequence. Yeah. Yeah. It has one pharmaceutical company of any consequence or pharma-related company, which is CSL, the old Commonwealth Serum Laboratories. Yeah. Um, so we have all these sectors that are around the world. When you look at Australia versus the rest of the world, it's basically we've got too many financials, uh, a lot of basic industries, too much property uh, in the form of real estate investment trusts or REITs, and we don't have any really sexy growing, you know, the, the really sexy stuff that you sort of say, hey, how am I going to kind of cover my retirement yeah, you know, yeah. with the industries that are going to be around in retirement? Yeah. And so thankfully, bit by bit, people are sort of pushing the money to overseas managers. But Australians love talking to the people who manage the money. And when the guy who manages the money is in sort of Des Moines, Iowa, it's a bit, you know, difficult. So. <laughs> yeah. What's uh, been your best investment? I'll give you two or three answers here. I think my best investment is an ability to read, which okay. we're going to come on to in a minute. Mm. But um, in terms of finance, I mean, I think there's, there's two ways to look at your best investment. There's the best investment which has made you the biggest financial return, um, either percentage-wise or dollar-wise. Um, and there's also the best, the best investment in the sense that um, if you reason out why a company is undervalued, and we'll talk about undervaluations in a minute, if you reason that out and your thesis on the company uh, works out as opposed to just dumb luck, there's a really, you know, you get a seriously warm glow about the fact that you actually analysed it properly, you did it properly, and you got the end result that you thought was right. So, um, in financial terms, um, things like Magellan Financial, um, in 2009, uh, in March 2009, you could have bought stock in Magellan Financial at 35 cents. Okay. The stock at the time had about 67 cents of cash and investments. So you've got the two fantastic people who at the time were running the company and trying to build the company up, Hamish Douglas and Chris Mackay, both of whom had credentialed careers prior to going out together to, to form Magellan. And there was a period of time where basically you, know, you had to pay quite a lot of money over net tangible asset backing to sort of invest with that in those guys and then you were actually that in a sense because you were buying at half of net asset backing they were coming to work for you <laughs> you know brilliant they're paying you to come to work how good's that now of course the stock's now 23 dollars well i don't own it oh, okay. Okay. in fact i actually have a short position in it at the moment believe it or not really? but um so i mean that that's just a you know that, that's just a multi 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 bagger for anybody that got there um Probably my favourite investment by a long way in, in terms of just um, working things out and, and giving you that really warm glow is a stock I made about three times my money on in about eight months. Um, 
and it's the Stockwell National Hire Group. And um, I was buying National Hire at about $1.30 a share, and um, within that eight months, he got a takeover offer at $3.60. Yeah. And the rationale behind it was that two guys, or two groups of people owned 88% of the company, so there's only 12% of the company was available for public, public investors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kerry Stokes owned okay. 66% through... Um, seven Group Holdings, which is his holding company listed on the stock market, and the richest man in Tasmania, second richest man, sorry, um, a guy called Dale Alphinston owned 22%. And what you reasoned out, and it's a really good lesson to think about when you're investing, is if you think a company's really cheap, it's a really good discipline to say, why might it be cheap? Okay? You know, because, I mean, there's all this information we get, so why might it be cheap? And some companies, they might be cheap because it's really obvious. If two guys own 88% of the stock and you know the, the residual stock trading on the stock market had a market value of only $27 million, then it's not likely that the AMP or BT are going to be investors in. It's too small. Yeah. Okay, So it means there's a chance it's mispriced. So that's number one. Secondly, its biggest asset was an unlisted company or a 46% stake in an unlisted company. That unlisted company is a company that you will see on every other street corner, especially at the moment. Coats hire. Oh, uh, right. Hire out safety barriers yeah, yeah. and diggers and God knows what. So what I did with the help of, believe it or not, a guy no older than you, uh, an intern who worked for me at the time, is we did all the company searches on ASIC. We worked out what we thought the value of the stake in, Nash, in uh, Coates High was. We worked out what we thought the rest of the company was worth. And believe it or not, we reasoned out that we thought the stock was worth about $3.60. Oh, wow. So we actually nailed it to the <laughs> penny. Um, there was a clause um, with a reconstruction of his empire that Kerry Stokes did that meant that he was going to have to make a recompense to seven group holdings if, if these shares weren't valued by an independent expert at more than $2.50. Um, which meant he would have had to pay a hundred million dollars when the cost of actually privatizing it was about thirty. Wow. So anyway, in the end, over eight months, and it was just great to see the roadmap of how it happened come off, as well mm. as the valuation. Mm. And if I say to you, "Hey, here's a dollar thirty that's worth three dollars sixty," you're, you're going to think I'm mad. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, yeah. You know, why, why has nobody picked up the dollar thirty and cashed it in? Yeah. So you've got to think like that. Mm. Oh, that's great. So there, there are a couple of good stories. I think, I mean, I'll be blunt with you, the other best investment, and it goes back to what we're talking about, about how young people um, find it difficult. Some of your other best investments are, you know, buying companies that go bankrupt. Okay. Why is that? Because you won't do it again. You won't make the same... <laughs> you, won't make the same you, you, you may buy another company that goes bankrupt, <laughs> but you won't buy it in the same industry. Yeah, um, I, I can assure you, I, um, you, will, you will have to go long and hard to find a retail stock in my portfolio because there aren't any. Yeah. I think Renis has come close. <laughs> yeah. My uh, you know, my you know, my, my track record of investing in retail is pretty ordinary and so I've just reasoned out it's just one of those things I'm just not that good at. Yeah, fair so enough. Just leave it alone. My um my first investment was Slater and Gordon. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> so I've learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Well I hope you learned I mean there's 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 one fundamental I mean the fundamental lesson about Slater and Gordon um, is, is really, really simple. And you've got to remember, there's, there's actually a very, very, uh, very astute uh, investor based in Australia who, who invests globally uh, called uh, Rob Luciano, and he runs a company called VGI. Um, they, of course, had a very public short position in Slater and Gordon. And oh, a right. short position for your uh, listeners is basically, um, it's, it's where you sell shares in a company that you don't own um, which you, you borrow the shares so you can effect the settlement. And, of course, the idea is you're selling them on the basis you're going to buy them back at a cheaper price because uh, you, you think they're going to go down. Um, VGI had a short position in Slater & Gordon at, if I remember rightly, well over $6 a share. The lesson on Slater & Gordon is really simple. It's one very simple sentence. <laughs> Profits does not equal cash flow. I can show you companies going out of business that are reporting profits. Yeah. I can also show you companies very much staying in business that are reporting losses but are generating large amounts of cash flow. Yeah. Okay. And the problem with Slater and Gordon was cash flow and profits were on different planets. Yeah. yeah. Because they were capitalizing the they were capitalizing the costs of 
all these mum and dad cases they were taking yeah, the, uh, here. No, and no, then no, a, no fee cases yeah, as well. And, and particularly, of course, in the UK when they made an appalling acquisition. Yeah, that I participated in the capital raising for. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Well, you, you won't forget profit <laughs> doesn't equal cash flow in a hurry with you, Adam. Okay, so I guess from that um, conversation, we should yeah. ask, what's the most important thing you've learned through, through the 35 years of investing? Um, I think that the, the really, I, I think there's three things, okay, really three things. The, the first is um, you've got to do your homework, okay. <laughs> the stock market, if you want to make it a casino, that's up to you, but most casinos I go to win money off the punter. Okay, it's not. These are not pieces of paper. They're not. They're not four-legged animals that run over twelve hundred meters. They 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 are stakes in a business. So if you don't understand the business that sits underneath the share in the business that you're buying, well, why on earth would you buy a share in it? You know, if I came to you and said, you know, race four number five, you know, you you you'd ignore me. And yet, so many people just speculate in shares because. Yeah, and they don't do the homework. So the first and really important thing is do your homework. Number two is what I've said already. You've got to be patient, okay? Uh, you know, you might get lucky, you know, very quickly. Uh, and, you know, yes, I have. But, you know, over periods of time, you need to hold your shares. Now, if you then put those two things together, it's the third thing I think that's really crucial as well. Um, if you think you know something about the business, then basically what you're putting together is a thesis as to why you want to own shares in the company. Okay, that you might be buying shares at a dollar that you think are worth two dollars. Okay. And there's a thesis behind that, you know, how can that dollar become two? Are they going to sell a loss making division? You know, are earnings going to grow really rapidly because they've got new products or they're just well positioned? What is it? Okay. So secondly obviously I say you've got to be patient. But you've got to have a thesis about it and then you've got to keep interrogating that thesis. Okay? So if we take, you know, um, you take something like, you know, something simple like uh, Woolworths, okay? Yeah, which obviously had a dream run from when it was taken out of the Adelaide Steamship Company in uh, 1994. Um, then, you know, it, it's when Woolworths' inability uh, in the last five years to keep reproducing, um, you know, their... Uh, growth in cash flow using other people's capital, uh, not not able to get the margins, and then particularly doing something called diversification. In other <laughs> words, taking a great business, getting the cash flow off it, and investing that in rubbish. And that's basically what that's the history of Woolworths really over the last ten years is taking a brilliant supermarket business, taking the fantastic cash flow out of it, and instead of giving it back to shareholders, they you know, they decide to blow up two billion dollars plus in taking on the best retail business in Australia, which is pretty stupid. Yeah. So once they started doing that, if your thesis on Woolworths is the ability to get cash flow back to me and grow earnings in supermarkets and, that's, and, and liquor, and I do stress one of the other great businesses in Australia is Dan Murphy's, and as soon as they started putting that money into other things, your thesis should have started falling down yeah. and you would have then sold your shares. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So it's it's once you're there, you've got to keep interrogating the reasons why you're there. Okay? That is really important. If you stick to those three lessons, you will not go too far wrong. Okay? Yeah. Mm. Seriously. Yeah, they're good lessons. So sort of backing off the lesson number one, doing your homework. Yeah. Um, and going to the next question yeah. of your investment style. Yeah. For our listeners, what are some sort of things that you look for in okay. the way that you invest? Right. Let's there there are two broadly different investment styles I and mean, there, there are lots of sub styles within these but let's keep it really simple okay some people basically invest in growth businesses so what they're doing is they're looking for businesses where they believe the earnings of the company can grow at a much bigger rate than the economy at large um, and so they tend to be less interested in um, what the valuation of the shares is, okay, or how much they're paying for it, okay. What they're focused on is, is this business continuing to grow? And they press the eject button and their, their thesis starts to get invalidated when these companies slow down in some way or other, 
Okay, so um, what you would find, I mean, typical companies like that in Australia, um, obviously Domino's Pizza, I think has been one of the most obvious ones. CSL has been one of the most obvious ones. Uh, REA Group or Real Estate. Uh, dot com. So if you find a fund manager that's got those kind of stocks in their portfolio, you, you would characterise them as a fund manager that's much more interested in growth. That's not me. I'm, I'm one of the other people. I'm one of the misers. I basically want to buy a dollar for 50 cents. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm what's called a value investor. And there are different strains of value investors, and I tend to be what's called a deep value investor. In other words, I tend to be a bit at the extreme. Okay. I'm looking to buy you know, companies at a significant discount to what I think they can be liquidated for okay? or, or what I think they're really worth. So if you look at my portfolio, it's full of all sorts of things which trade at a discount to net tangible asset backing. It's full of companies that um, trade on what's called a price earnings ratio or the, the number of years earnings that I am paying for, obviously the lower the better, yep. uh, of below 10 and it's also full of companies that you would think um, are really pretty crappy businesses. <laughs> and I think they're not great businesses either, but I just think the market's undervalued them too much. And I'll, I'll give you two or three really good examples as we go on in the, you know, over the past two or three years. And I'll give you one absolute classic example. Maybe let's do that now. It's a Benjamin Graham style. Don't forget, Benjamin Graham style worked in the 1920s through the 1940s and everything else, but you, you have to adapt the Benjamin Graham style. The reason for that is that partic- you know, industries change so damn quickly. Yeah. Okay? They change really quickly because of technology. You know, the speed of technological change over your generation and certainly over the you know, latter part of my life has just been absolutely staggering since really the early 1990s you know, with the advent of the net and then what the net enables you to actually do. Um, you know, and don't, you, know, you think about what the net's done to banking yeah, yeah. You know, and, and what it's actually done to the banks beneficially. You know, it's tremendous. Um, let's give you a really good example of, of um, sort of deep value investing and it's also, oh, I really want to emphasise this, one of the things you've got to think about to be a good investor is don't do the obvious. Okay, let's merge. Like if we merge those two things together, um, eighteen months ago, I had a roaring argument on Twitter <laughs> with somebody who publishes a a newsletter in Australia, which will have to remain nameless. Okay. Um, but the last word of it is exactly what this particular individual is. Uh, Fool. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> our, our rival podcast. Yes. <laughs> the Motley Fool said, short cap charge, it's going out of business, Uber <laughs> is going to kill it. <laughs> well, mate, tell me something we don't know, okay? You know, tell me something we don't know, that Uber's here in Australia, it's being legalised and it's having an impact. Yeah. You know, wow, <laughs> you know, that's, you know... That's that you know. That's new scoop, isn't it? <laughs> so cab charge. So he says short sure, cab charge. Yeah. Um, at the time, I'd gone long cab charge, and I started buying cap, cab charge shares at two dollars seventy. The reason I started buying cab charge shares at two dollars seventy was that cab charge had a whole bunch of other assets. Uh, cab charge owned fifty percent of Hills buses. Okay. Cab charge owns fifty percent of a whole bunch of cabs and stuff in London and Aberdeen. Um, cab charge owns a whole bunch of taxi plates, okay, in other words, and so it rents the cabs to people. Yeah. It is the biggest taxi plate owner in Australia, both New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, South Australia and Northern Territory. Um, and cab charge basically uh, gets its name from the payments system, which three years ago was taking 10% skim off your credit card when you paid in a cab. And that skim has now been mandated by law to come down to 5% basically everywhere across Australia. I think there's one state left uh, where it's not. So, cab charges earnings were coming down. Their profits were coming down, obviously. Um, but what's interesting is what Scoop didn't realise is that the ridership in cab charges taxis was continuing to grow. The simple fact of life is what Uber's done is grown the market for people who want to use private hire, private car services to get from A to B. And it's quite clearly brought the price down. We all know that. Yeah. Okay, But 
what it's done is it's grown the market. And what Cab Charge have done is they've taken their costs down. Uh, they have created new apps. You know, if you go now, there's there's one three cabs, which is a new app they developed in in a relatively short space of time that does everything an Uber app does. You all know about surge pricing on Uber. So if it's raining, what are you going to get? A cab or an Uber? I'm telling you, you're going to get a cab. Yeah. Okay. And so what's happened is that you're seeing the ongoing demand for cabs will grow. Now their earnings have gone down because their ten percent cuts gone down to five. Okay, now there's no business can withstand the halving of the yeah. price of their product without their profits going backwards. But what's happened in the meantime is, of course, Cab Charge have decided, well, we're in the you know we're in the private transport business, so they've sold their 50% share in Hills Buses. They've sold a property they had in Surrey Hills for 18 million dollars. They've repaid all their debt. Uh, effectively, and they're now about to disgorge a 90 cent fully frank dividend to their lucky shareholders. Now, it's a one off, uh, or 80 of it is a one off. Uh, the upshot is 18 months on from $2.70, the stock price is now $4.10, and in the meantime, I've had 30 cents in fully frank dividends to keep me happy, yeah, well. which is pretty good. And it's all because of the investment thesis being that cab charge were going to get rid of their non-core assets, that non-core assets were not as valuable as they said they were in the books, but even at my much discounted valuation, at one stage I was buying their cab business uh, at what I effectively thought was a P of about four. Okay. Well. Now, I don't care if it's going out of business, as long as it takes more than four years to go out of business, I'm <laughs> happy. Yeah? yeah, and what what people assume sometimes is that the fade rate on old things is really steep. It's often a lot shallower than you think. Uh, the best example of that, of course, is cigarettes. Yeah, uh, there's no way any percentage of your generation smokes in the same way that my generation did at your age. But of course, some of the best investments in the world over the past five, six, seven years have been tobacco stocks. Well, okay. You know, if you don't have an ethical problem. So people, the fade rate, people assume that it's too too quick. Can I just give you another really good example yeah, of thinking yeah, outside the square a little bit? Um, one of the... Uh, I've made really good money over the last two or three years investing in media stocks. Okay, now, you know, you, you're going to read your papers about Channel yeah, 10. Yeah. Um, I, I've had a brief flirtation with Channel 10. I've never owned Channel 7. Uh, I have and do own Channel 9. I have and I've traded and do own Fairfax. Yeah. Um, and what you found is that all these media companies, as their core business was just being eaten away by um, the fact that your generation don't read newspapers, you know, you get your news off the net, your generation don't watch rubbish on television, um, you know, you watch it on streaming services like Netflix or whatever. Um, then what you found is these companies, in, in the midst of cutting costs, they had so many surplus assets. And so yeah, what you found is all these companies had other little businesses that the stock market really undervalued. Uh, there's a company called APN, which is um, Australian Provincial Newspapers. Uh, they had a fantastic outdoor advertising business, which they span out to shareholders. They, got, they, uh, they, um, they basically... Uh, maintained their radio business and they, they ditched the newspaper business. So people just undervalued the earnings stream. Fairfax, which you of course think is a newspaper business, you know, it's newspapers, it owns, um, it owns about half of Macquarie Radio Network, um, which is the radio network you don't listen to because you're <laughs> yeah. age 70 two, plus. Two, is it 2GB? Right, 2GB, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a dominant network, makes, makes good money. But the key driver, Fairfax is not a new city, it's a, it's a property company. Okay? Mm -hmm. The reason it's a property company is Fairfax owned Domain. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And Domain is going to be spun off. And the valuation of Domain is obviously much higher that, you know, th than the valuation of a dying newspaper yeah, business. Yeah. And, it, and the newspaper business is dying. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so uh, at certain times, you know, Fairfax got down uh, at one stage to... Um, what about forty cents a share? You know, yeah. the stock's now you know in the high nineties, um, and you know if domain is spun off, I think it's you know obviously I'm long the stock. I think there'll be you know some benefit from that. And Fairfax management have been really astute at 
trading assets, selling off assets, creating new digital type assets and then selling them at good valuations and, okay. and everything else. They've been very good at that to shareholders' benefit. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Wow. So that's, that's what I mean. It's just you carry those two examples with you, yeah. you know, and say, hey, if everybody, you know, think outside the box. The obvious is not always the case, yeah. you know. So with Channel 9, yeah. is the thesis similar to Fairfax, the, like good management? Yeah the, thesis, the, yeah, the thesis is similar to Channel 9 in that the, the, the fade rate on the 9 network itself uh, is, is pretty, you know, it's pretty shallow. Yeah. You know, okay. Whilst ever they've got rugby league, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know that that's good. The management are actually extremely good. Yeah. Um, and so, whilst the network is making less money each each year, it just mints cash flow. And Channel Nine have relatively little debt. They have got a tiny bit, but it's very very small. Uh, they sold Willoughby, their headquarters, mm. so they sold that asset off. They used to own Ticketek, so they've sold that asset off. Okay. But they actually have one growth asset. And they own fifty percent, and Fairfax own fifty percent of Stan. All oh, right. And Stan is the most rapidly growing SVOD or um, streaming video on demand service in Australia. Really? And they have a really good con. They have really good content deals with the prime suppliers of content. The US, um, I call them studios, but it's people like Showtime in their case. Yeah. Right. And so what they're doing is, I mean, you know, the way you watch stuff has changed dramatically. You don't sit there in front of the idiot box waiting for your best <laughs> program to come on. You stream it. Yeah. You know, whether, whether you stream it legally or illegally. <laughs> um, and Stan has some really good content on it. And so, you know, their su- subscriber base is really rapidly increasing and the thing will break even in financial year 18. Oh, wow. And okay. so there are a lot of people arguing that Stan's worth 400 million bucks from a standing start in about two years. And so it's 200 million apiece to Fairfax and Nine. And when you consider that Channel Nine's valued at less than a billion dollars, and the network makes about $180 million of cash a year. Mm. Get wow. the idea? Stan. Stan is the future, I guess. <laughs> Stan is the future. Yeah. Uh, so has that philosophy of investing, deep value investing, has that changed over the years? Or is the, that... No, nah, the philosophy hasn't changed, but how you do it has. Yeah, that's what's in the hands. Yeah, it's, yeah. the, it's the adaptation of that, that that's changed. I mean, that's the, you, you will all, you, know, you, you all get given Benjamin Graham books to read and everything else. And it's, it's, it's obvious the philosophy is fantastic, but trying to find what are called net nets, which is, you know, stocks trading under their networking capital is a bit difficult. Yeah. The other thing changes, I mean, basically, um, if you go back 15 years and if you read, books that are 15 to 20 years old and some of the great books I'm going to mention to you were, were, were published then. You, you'll see the best industries they all talk about are newspapers because mm. newspapers then were so-called rivers of gold because of classified advertising and display advertising there was no other way to do it. Of course that's changed. Yeah. So it's a matter of the, 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 the philosophy hasn't changed but how you do it has. Management I believe is so much more important than they were years ago. Mm. Um, Mainly because, you know, management have got to be smart and keep up with technological change and infuse that change into their business. Um, you know, whatever you think about Domino's Pizza's work practices and, and payments, the fact is, I mean, the infusion of technology into their business, yes. um, you know, has, has brought their cost base down. It's made them, you know, it's basically, you know, it's just making everybody fat because it's <laughs> too easy to, you know, order pizza and everything else. And yeah. I think as well, it's it's... Um, valuation versus price, again. I mean, the valuation's different. You have to look at a lot of much longer-term income constraints. You know, you don't value a motorway based on, you know, this year's earnings, you know, when the motorway's got 30 years of franchise yeah. left. So, you know, that, that type of thing, the, the work you have to do to value things has is, is, is become a bit more complex. Um, and I, I think the third thing that's, that's really important in that... You know, it's, it's changed with me. You really look to companies that are shareholder friendly. You know, some companies are downright shareholder unfriendly. You know, they're not. You know, they're, they're more. You know, it's the management. Um, you know, they're interested in feathering their own nest, or you've yeah. got a major shareholder who doesn't care about minority shareholders. I mean, you might contemplate. You know, the recent furor at Channel Seven. You know, in relation to the chief executive officer's uh, private life. You know, when you look, I mean, you really need to ask yourself the question, do you think the actions that Channel 7 have taken are shareholder friendly? Yeah. Yeah. I'll leave you to answer that question. 
And I think um, for for people starting out, mm. that side of mm. valuing or getting an understanding of the companies is a lot easier if they didn't have the technical ability. Yeah. What what you need to understand about shareholder friendly is really two bit. There's two or three bits to it. I mean, it's basically it's management that welcome shareholders. You know, that they sort of you know, um, you know, they're, they're open to a little bit of critique from shareholders, if you will, and everything else. But what you really want to see out of a management is that they're driven by um, you know creating value for shareholders, such as buying their own shares back when mm. they're really cheap, not being empire builders. I mean, let's you know let's blunt about it. I mean, Woolworths went on this big ego-driven empire-building idea to take on their main supermarket competitor when this main supermarket competitor was uh, not at its strongest and they said, oh, we'll go attack. We'll go attack the heart of their business, you know, the West Farmers business, Bunnings. What a stupid idea that was. Yeah, Was that driven by shareholder value to Woolworths shareholders? No. It was driven by management and board madness. Okay, so you've got to have the right management and the right board that are driven by returns to shareholders. There is a fabulous book called Outsiders, um, oh, Malcolm, 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 yeah. yep, which is well worth looking at because it's basically uh, there's a whole series of case studies in there, and every single case study revolves around the fact these companies buy back their own shares when they think they're cheap. Um, I'll give you an example in a minute of another company that's doing that. Um, but you know, when their shares, they, when the company feels the shares are undervalued, not just at any old time, but when they sh- when they feel the shares are undervalued, then they buy their shares back. Imagine if you're a company and your shares are trading at a dollar, and you think as a company with a reasoned analysis they're worth two dollars. You know, I want to be a shareholder in that company at a dollar because I'm going to buy some stock myself, and B, I know you're playing alongside me as well. So there'll be less shares on issue. Mm. So my part of the company, I've got more of the company and it's worth more. That's not to say every time a company does a buyback, though, they think that their shares are undervalued. No, there's too much, in Australia in particular, there's far too much ego around buybacks. Um, and there's, there's too many companies end up buying their own shares back and then issuing shares at a lower price to fund a new factory acquisition, yeah. whatever. So that's a great way to check out whether you think management are actually really any good. You know, if they're buying their shares back at a crazy valuation, I mean, that's well, they're not very good, are they? You know, really, you know, they're not, you know, that's not a shareholder friendly thing. That's doing something else. They're frightened of a takeover or yeah. something like that. It's got some ulterior motive. So if you were to give advice to someone who's just starting out investing or is interested in starting to invest, yes. what, what would you say? Oh, that's really easy. Read, 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 <laughs> and when you finish reading, read some more. And luckily these days, uh, listen, 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 and listen. You have access, thanks to the net, you have access to anything you want, as we discussed right at the start of this podcast. You have access to anything you want on the net. Um, I have recently listened to the webcast of the fourth quarter results of the world's largest aircraft leasing company. Okay, And those guys are staggering. They are smart at running their business. They buy back a heap of stock, but always at a discount to their net tangible asset backing. And, and so, you know, and these guys are uh, nationally based in Dublin. So I'm sat here in Sydney and I plug some headphones into the laptop and off we go, you know. And it's open to anybody. So you have, the, the biggest problem you have is actually working out what not to read and what not to listen to because you either will never sleep at night or you won't have a day job because you'll be doing something else. So that, that is, there, there are books, there are so many brilliant articles on the net, okay, that people just willingly put up there. What you find is that people who have a, um, a bias like myself to value investing, they're really good at sharing their ideas. They tend to be very, you know, giving sort of people. Um, there, there are lots of sort of uh, chat boards and things like that. I, you know, like really good quality ones, not not rubbish where you've got, you know, people trying to jip you into buying shares in something. <laughs> yeah, you know, really good quality chat boards. Um, you know, where whereby you know you can just look. You know, and that's that's what's so good about it. You can take. You don't have to give. Mm. 
it's brilliant. You know, it's you can be as selfish as you want, but you've just got to read, 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 and read. And it's through that that you will start to understand different businesses. And if you've got a full-time career at something else, uh, I'm telling you one thing. If you can't find stuff in your investing um, career or your investing interest that you can't apply in your full-time career in management at work, I'll, I'll be amazed. You know, you, you must have an extremely um, you know, specialised career <laughs> you know, if you can't apply that. So you've just got to read, 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 and read some more and read some more. And there's an infinite amount of material. Yeah. So given that there is such an infinite amount of material, yep. what, what do you prioritise in terms of what you read or listen to? Um, what I prioritise is basically, I mean, it's obviously companies that I think I'm going to be interested in. And, and is it their sort of annual reports? Or yeah, it it's, it, it's things like, it's annual reports, quarterly reports of the companies in the US. Um, it's company presentations. Um, I read a lot of stuff from other investors. Okay. Remember, what, you know what we said at the outset. It's great, great occupation. This because you can contract in people that are smarter than you, and the way you do that is to read what they say. Mm. So I read a lot of hedge fund newsletters. Okay. Now, you know, hedge funds are sort of on the nose for a lot of people at the moment because they haven't performed very well. But um, you know, a lot of hedge funds are really good about giving maybe a two-page thesis on why they own X, Y, Z companies. Uh, some hedge funds give sort of 52-page <laughs> presentations on why they own something or other. I mean, clearly all they're trying to get people to do is go buy it after yeah. they've already <laughs> yeah. bought it. But you can, you, know, you can look at it. You can interrogate that and say, hmm, you're wrong. You know, I think you're wrong because of A, B, and C. So I, I prioritise that sort of stuff. But I do read uh, things like, um, you know, you'd be nuts not to read things like Jeff Bezos' you know, a annual note to Amazon shareholders. Yeah. You know, I'm not a shareholder in Amazon, uh, but you know, there, there's so much great information in there. You know, it's the same, you know, the, the Warren Buffett letters are sort of starting to become a bit of a parody of themselves, unfortunately. Yeah. They're not, you know, they, you know, which you must understand, you know, as the guy gets older, they're not going to be as pointed and, mm. and quite as to the point as, as, as they were 20 years ago. But that doesn't stop you because you can find all the old ones. Mm. Yeah. They're all on the net. You can find, you know, you can find any reports of uh, the old Westco, which was Charlie Munger's company. Mm. Uh, that's now been absorbed into Berkshire Hathaway. So, yeah, those kind of things, they, they are really good reading. Unfortunately, you know, as I say, you need to read some of the older, I think, Berkshire letters rather than necessarily, you know, the, the newer ones. Mm. Yeah. But you can read great shareholder letters like that. Mm. Um, yeah, and they're great reading. Whether you're interested in the company or not, they're going to teach you something else. Well, we've both read Buffett's, well, uh, the conglomeration of all of his letters yeah, it's called. I think the book's called Word. Is it Words of Wisdom? Or yeah, there's there's several there's several sort of compilation books of, of mm. Buffett. Yeah. Um, to be blunt, I think the best book to read on Buffett is is Roger Lowenstein's The Making of an American Capitalist, because um, it 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 focuses on Buffett the investor, and it really does start from scratch. Right. You know how he got started, the original Buffett partnerships, the winding up of those, the staking yeah. Berkshire Hathaway, this yeah. you know crappy old cotton mill in New Hampshire, <laughs> etc. So it actually takes you through. And what you've got to understand, and I mean the best chapters in the book revolve around 1974, because you know the world was in serious crisis in 1974, and you know obviously the guy was buying shares like they were going out of fashion because they were so cheap. You know, but you know. It, it took, you know, it, it, even he was sort of getting to the point of exhaustion on, mm -hmm. on that. That's a really good book because that tells you sort of how he got to where he got to. Um, and, you know, it, it obviously there's, a, there's quite a bit about newspapers in there, the mm -hmm. uh, Buffalo Evening News and the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. But, of course, it's got... Um, there's, there's a famous court case involving the two newspapers in Buffalo. It's sort of Buffett's paper effectively put the other out of business. And... Um, I can't remember his exact quotes, but uh, the, the judge asked Buffett uh, about the, is, it, is it true that he um, he characterised the um, Buffalo Evening News as, as being a great business, and Buffett explains what his best business is, which is the only Tollbridge into town. Oh, okay. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah, yeah. You're the only Tollbridge into town. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Australia has a name for that. It's called Macquarie, but. <laughs> so. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it, lots of books, but no, you know, it's the sort of annual reports and the presentations yeah. and, and everything else that are kind of key things. But if you see other research, you must, I mean, broker research is, you know, it's got its detractors, 
um, but um, and you know some of it can be quite interesting, but uh, it tends to be a bit repetitive, and it's it's rare that a broker will really systematically carve a company to pieces. Mm. Yeah. So um, there you go. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Great. I think we're up to E72. Okay. Uh, books. Oh, yeah, books. Books, 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 books. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I have a... Uh, my favourite book. Okay. Um, I, have a, I have an Amazon printout here for my favourite book. Um, my favourite book is written by a gentleman called Seth Klarman. Seth Klarman runs a hedge fund called Baupost, B-A-U-P-O-S-T. And he wrote a book some years ago called Margin of Safety, which is given to all Baupost employees and the ones that leave keep it and then sell it on Amazon. (laughs) And the reason they sell it on Amazon is because the going price of it, it's not in print, is $995. Yeah, it's got here on Amazon, five new from $1,699. There you go. So so did he not publish this? He just gave it to his employees. Yeah, it was sort of published a long time ago, but he's now out of print. Um, however, Alec, if you look to your left, there is a folder next to you. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. If you know where to go on the internet, you can pull down a PDF of it. Not that I'm suggesting you do anything illegal. <laughs> um, something that's a bit easier to get, and I, I, I preface this with some of the things I, I, I commented to you earlier on. Um, but some of these books are from the, the 1980s, the 1990s, and so some of the industry analysis in them you're going to find difficult uh, because it doesn't gel with you. Um, two of the great books were written by a gentleman called Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch ran the, Fidel- the Fidelity Magellan Fund for a number of years, and he published two best-selling books. The first one was called One Up on Wall Street, mm. and the second one was called Beating the Street. And it's actually, it's a bit of a rarity sometimes when the sequel is better than the original. And I think in, in, in this case, um, the sequel is, is actually slightly better than the original. Um, so what's, what's great about the sequel is um, it's got 25 golden rules. And the 25 golden rules in, include such absolute gems as... Investing is fun, exciting, and dangerous if you don't do any work. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the, the other one, which you, you might sort of recognise a little bit from some of my earlier comments, uh, but nobody can predict interest rates, the future direction of the economy, or the, or the stock market. Hmm. Dismiss all such forecasts and concentrate on what's actually happening to the companies in which you're invested. So if you sit there listening to Tom Petrovsky and his little things on the news, and if you sit there listening to financial television like CNBC and everything else, um, you are going to start voiding some of the first things that I told you. Be patient. Because they're telling you, huff and puff, rates are going up, rates are going up, the market's going to crash, da-da-da, and you get right away from what the hell this is all about, which yeah. is the fact that you own a small claim on a company. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, the Lynch books are great. Um, there's a more recent book called um, 100 Baggers, which is actually an update on a previous book, um, which, was, uh, which was written 30-odd years ago, and this is by a guy called Christopher Mayer. It's called 100 Baggers, Stocks That Return 100 to 1, and how to find them. In other words, you put a dollar in and it becomes worth 100. That's a really that's a really good book. It's actually it was only written last year, oh, wow. so it's actually really good because it teaches you patience. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd recommend most of the Warren Buffett type books. I think they're pretty good. Um, Tap Dancing to Work by Carol Loomis is probably a really good one, um, which is uh, which is um, you know they're really good. Um, I have given uh, Bryce and Alec uh, a copy of. Um, a list of books by uh, a gentleman called Monish Pabrai um, and I hope that they will publish a link on the website and sure. if, if yeah. they don't um, just go to dub 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 called chat with Pabrai P-A-B-R-A-I dot com and go to his bookshelf 
And if you don't have enough reading, there's 307 books on investment <laughs> and capital allocation in there, and uh, most of the ones I've mentioned to you are contained in that list, as you would expect. Yeah, we'll definitely throw yeah. that up on yeah. the website. Yeah. One of the other things I do recommend to you is um, investment biographies or business biographies. Mm. Read about people who've been really, really successful in business. Okay, so there, there, there's heaps of business biographies about you know guys who. Know, who've done amazingly well in, in one particular industry or other. And also, read biographies about business disasters. Okay. Because you'll learn just as much, if not more, from the ones about the guys who get it wrong and go bust, as you will from the guys who get it right and make tons of money. Mm. Yeah, cool. Some ones I'm pretty keen on. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. <laughs> oh, good. So that brings us to the end of the first half of our interview with Andrew Brown. We hope you've taken some things away from that. We definitely learn a thing or two. If you click on episode six of Equity Mates, you'll be able to hear the second half of the interview where we delve deeper into all things investing. Equity Mates. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. and the people appearing in this program may have positions in the companies mentioned. This is general advice only. Please speak to a financial professional to understand how it may pertain to your individual situation.